Hi, I'm Jake Bruton, and today on the Build Show Network, we are going to talk about vapor, and more importantly, we're going to talk about water vapor in your building assembly. So let's start the conversation about uh, water vapor by talking about the four control layers in a, in a, in a building. So. Number one, and I'm gonna list them in order of importance in case you don't already know them. Uh, sorry if this is a refresher for some of you. Number one is our water management layer. Uh, that could be shingles, that could be a um, cladding of some sort, it could be zip sheathing. Whatever we're doing to manage the water and uh, provide a continuity that is keeping bulk water from getting into our walls. And let's be clear, the reason this is first is because bulk water is the most important killer in buildings. If your building's going to die, chances are it's bulk water. Uh, statistically speaking, it's one of the things that builders get sued the most over as well. Number two, we're gonna talk about an air control layer. Uh, so now that we've managed for water, now we're worried about is our building leaking air? And the reason this is in front of thermal is because it doesn't matter if I make a 12 inch thick wall or a six foot thick wall, fill it with insulation, the second I leave the window or a door open, now I've negated the, the effort that I put into my thermal control layer, which means it only matters if uh, you air seal first. So. Air is our number two. Number three is thermal. As I just said, a wall without any insulation in it is gonna have a very hard time resisting heat flow across the assembly, and you are likely to have comfort and energy efficiency issues if that's the case. Number four on control layers, the one we're gonna talk about today, is vapor. And uh, the reason we put it forth uh, as my good friend Steve Basic always says, if we solve for the other ones, water and air and thermal, then we are a lot less likely to have vapor be an issue. So rather than solving for vapor by itself most of the time, the majority of what we do is solve for air, water, or water, air, and thermal, and therefore we have already then solved for vapor. So let's talk about vapor, let's talk about air, let's, let's talk about three methods uh, to, um, to increase the likelihood, or, or decrease the likelihood, sorry, rather, uh, that vapor would ever be an issue in your assembly. So number one, we must air seal our assembly. So we're back to that conversation about the control layers. And the reason this is important is vapor gets in your wall or your assembly, roof, wall, floor, whatever it is, and then uh, condenses onto something, it moves into the wall as a gas, condenses onto something, and then it's bulk water and it becomes your, your number one problem again. It becomes a water issue rather than a vapor issue. And so we're not concerned if it stays as a vapor or if it's vapor inside the building but not inside the assembly. So by building a really airtight envelope, we reduce the amount of air moving through the assembly, uh, which makes perfect sense, right? If your house is air sealed to uh, 0.6 ACH50 or, or, or 1.0 ACH50, the amount of air moving through your walls is very small. It's a very small amount of, of air. Uh, I mean, or virtually nothing. Well, if there's no air moving through your walls, there's no moist air moving through your walls, or there's no air that is a vehicle for vapor to then migrate into your walls. So our number one method to try to stop vapor from ever becoming an issue in our assemblies is air seal. And it makes perfect sense. If it's not flowing through the wall, then it's not taking things with it like air or pollutants or pollen or whatever it is. And now we've reduced our risk greatly when it comes to uh, vapor intrusion into the wall. Uh, number two, the second method 
is to uh, play with the uh, condensation point or the dew point of the wall, the, the, the point at which that vapor will turn from vapor to uh, liquid water. Uh, and that's important because we're not bothered by a, a little bit of vapor in the assembly if it never condenses, if it never causes damage, if it, you know, if it's not really a water issue. So, how do we raise the condensation point of the wall? How do we raise that point in the wall uh, above the temperature where we would get condensation, above our dew point? Well, we do that by adding exterior insulation. That's the easiest method. Uh, I think the rule of thumb is somewhere in 30% of the wall, or 30% of your R value should be outboard for my market. Uh, so we're clear, this is a conversation that takes place most of the time for uh, Climate Zone 4 and up. And I think you could probably make an argument that uh, Climate Zone 4 might not even be this concerned with it. Some of the modeling shows that we should be and the code thinks that we should be on some level. Uh, so we just are concerned. And uh, in reality, when you do number one and you air seal a house really well, uh, that limits the, the wetting, but it also limits the potential drying. So we have to keep that in mind. So we're trying to make our, our assembly more durable and uh, adding exterior insulation raises the temperature of the wall and reduces the risk that something in there gets to a dew point, gets to a condensation point. So think of it this way, if somewhere in that wall assembly, it's going to go from 72 degrees inside and 10 degrees outside, uh, and you put two feet of insulation on the outside of the wall and then uh, your air control layer and then framing and uh, you know fluffy insulation in that cavity, the air barrier inward is never gonna get below you know, 70 degrees. It's gonna have so much exterior insulation that it's never gonna cool down. Whatever that condensation point, that dew point is, is outside of your envelope and you're not worried about it. So if you just take those things to the extreme, it's much easier to understand. You put an R100 on the outside of your wall, you hang it on the outside, you do it in rock wool or board, uh, you know, foam insulation of some sort, and then all of a sudden the temperature that is in that insulation and outside, you get your condensation outside the building and you're not worried about it. So now we've reduced that vapor uh, just by changing where our insulation is placed. Uh, and I think that's actually something cool that the code recognizes with the idea that, um, you know, it gives you that, I think our market is uh, R13 plus five, and that plus five is continuous insulation. Like the code recognizes that, that that continuous insulation on the outside of the wall can be a good thing. And the code's okay with that. Uh, and if you're good at math, R13 plus five is an R18, but our code is higher than R18. So it's nice that it, it, it's recognized in that way. Uh, and the number three way that we uh, take care of moisture in the wall or, or that we uh, reduce our risk of uh, vapor intrusion into the wall is to eliminate interior moisture. And I know that that, that might be challenging, it might sound weird, but uh, if you are operating a greenhouse inside your house and you're running at a um, you know, 80% relative humidity, there is a lot more available moisture to migrate into that assembly than if you are operating at 10% relative humidity. There's a lot less moisture to then migrate into the uh, assembly. Now, both of those, 80% and 10%, are probably not healthy for human occupants and possibly or potentially your your pets as well but if you can operate your home somewhere in the uh let's say 40 to 55 percent and find your comfort level in there uh that is a lot less humidity inside the building and you have a less likely uh opportunity for uh water vapor to then migrate into the walls uh so there are there are three methods there. We're going to air seal the assembly so that we don't have air traveling through the assembly to begin with. We are going to raise the temperature of the wall by adding exterior insulation. And we are going to dehumidify the interior of the building. So if you 
don't let the moisture into the wall, if you warm the wall, and then if you don't allow there to be moisture to then get into the wall. That's the way I think of it. Uh, those are the three criteria that you need to be thinking of when you're thinking about controlling this, uh, when you're thinking about controlling uh, water vapor. Now, the other question that is part of this water vapor 101 discussion is, well, I don't understand if my wall is air sealed, but we could still potentially get moisture in there uh, through vapor diffusion. I don't understand it. How come I can use drywall as an air barrier, but I can't use it as a vapor barrier? And this is one that I've actually had with multiple employees over the years since I started talking about this, since I gained an understanding about this. And I had an employee go, BS, there's absolutely no way that something can let water vapor through if it won't let air through. And the first time that it was said to me, I actually went, yeah, it does make sense to think of it like that. The argument does make sense from that perspective. Uh, it doesn't once you understand things on the molecular level. So if we look at air, it's, uh, you know, obviously there's a ton of stuff in our air that we breathe. For the most part, it is N2O2, nitrogen, and oxygen, and the two means two of those atoms attached. So, into O2 plus a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, argon and, and radon and, and hydrogen, and the, you, there's tons of stuff attached to that, but they're all not as important as the first two, so that's why uh, that conversation starts with N2O2. But if we look at water vapor, it's still water. So, H2O, H2O, as in one single oxygen atom, N2O2 is two oxygen atoms. So therefore, if we just look at it from an oxygen standpoint, uh, there's double the amount of oxygen in air than there is in water, which makes perfect sense. That's why, part of why we don't breathe water. Uh, but there's your answer is that it's a molecular scale issue and it allows for migration on a smaller scale. Uh, I like to think of it as uh, the difference between uh, uh, a quarter and a dime. There's, I've been told that it's two and a half times the size. Uh, I, I have not verified that in any way, but mentally I just picture it as they're a different scale, uh, I guess is a better way to say it. Uh, don't quote me on the quarter dime thing. I was told that by an artist, not a scientist. Uh, so, if we look at it from a scientific approach, uh, things can be airtight but vapor open, uh, and that's why uh, drywall doesn't make a good vapor barrier or vapor control layer, whereas the um, drywall will make or can make a good air barrier. So. In next week's video, we are gonna talk about how we are managing for vapor on a current project. Uh, a lot of what we just talked about, but put into practice, we're gonna look at a building section, we're gonna look at the actual building, and we're gonna talk about some uh, specific ideas and specific materials that I think can be of great asset to other builders that I feel like are uh, under acknowledged in our industry for being fantastic. So stay tuned till next week. We'll talk about vapor again. We'll put all of the theory that we just talked about into practice. For now, make sure that you sign up for the newsletter. Matt Reisinger, Brent Hull, Steve Basic, and Wade Paquin are putting up weekly videos. That's six new videos a week. There is a ton of knowledge being shared. It's free. Sign up for the newsletter so you don't miss any of it. Don't forget to check me out on Instagram. It's jake.bruton. Also, don't forget that Steve Basic, Peter Yost, and I host a uh, twice-monthly podcast on building and building science that is uh, the Unbuild It podcast. You can find us on Instagram. You can find it on all of the available podcast uh, listening device or apps. 
Uh, we really cover deep dive on some things, and I just spent, what, 15 minutes talking about vapor? Well, there's an episode where Steve, Peter, and I spend an hour talking about vapor. So there's certainly more to learn. Don't forget to tune in next week and don't miss that vapor video. For now, thanks for watching. I'm Jake Bruton on The Build Show. Have a good day.